Hey guys, so I'm at Columbia. I'm in the lounge of the dorm that I live in and I'm getting ready to film a video with one of my friends who lives on the same floor. He's over here. JC, for God's sake, turn around, please. Oh, sorry. I didn't see you there. I was too busy admiring the fire extinguisher. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's, that's good for you. If that's the kind of life you want to live. It is. We're going to say goodbye to him, but yeah. We're just gonna figure out how to set up this room for maximum filming efficiency. So I'll see you guys in a little while and we're gonna film a video and hopefully you guys will like it. I'm so excited for you all to see it. I did! I did do all the work. Okay, you did do Strong all the work. Strong like bull. Action. Action. Okay, let's do this. We should like move slightly. Or over here. Okay. Ready? Salutations. Hey guys, it's Crystal back at it again with another video. And today I have a very special guest on my channel. This is my friend, JC, who also goes to Columbia with me. And he has so graciously agreed to film this video with me because he did a bunch of science research in high school, specifically for physics. And he did really well in certain competitions, did a lot of research. He just got a paper published, which is really exciting. And he's going to tell us all his experience with one particular competition in high school, which was the ISEF competition, so the International Science and Engineering Fair, and how that works and what his experience was like. So JC, can you give us an idea of what ISEF was like? Like, what actually is it? Okay, so ISEF stands for the International Science and Engineering Fair. Uh, during my year, 2018, it was sponsored by Intel and it was located in Pittsburgh. And it was a great experience where I got to meet people from around the world uh, and be able to just talk with a bunch of students and a bunch of people who were my age that were very interested in science and wanted to change the world just like I did. You had to qualify at like the regional or the state level. I qualified at the state level to be able to move on to the international level. And it was, it was fun, but it wasn't easy to say the least. Um, you had to do a whole lot to be able to make it past uh, the first rounds of judges and then also something called the lightning round. NYSEF was all in one day. So you started out real early in the morning or getting ready. You see the ceremony and stuff happen and they talk you through how the day is going to go. You're going to have about three judges, uh, potentially more than three. Uh, just to see if they want to move you on to the lightning round. See, they're, the judges are deliberating the entire time. They have a board, like a literal board, mm -hmm. where they write down your names, your project number, and like where they rank you, essentially. And can everyone see that? No, 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 no. Not everyone can see it. It's in the room that the, uh, the judges are working in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I've never seen it, but... That's what I've been told, and I've been told by the president of, uh, of NYSEF. Can you give us an idea of what your actual project was and why you went with that? So the project that I started off with was with the crystals, uh, except in, in that lab, we synthesized new materials uh, in single crystal form. So it's like as pure as you can possibly get, um, or at least the best attempt at getting uh, pure crystals without like grain boundaries that would make it hard to analyze in the lab. Uh, you don't want to get a powder. Um, you really want to get single crystals so you can be able to look at the crystal structure and be able to, you know, do a myriad of things with them. Uh, but essentially what I did my first year, and I was really lucky, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, there was very little, like, a very tiny amount of planning that went into doing what I did. And it was, it was kind of a mistake, but that's, that's the best part about research. It's serendipitous. So, I mean, you can make as many mistakes as you want. You know, one really wants to make a mistake, but I mean, I did. And it turned out pretty well. I created a new material and um, it was, it was great. 
honestly, I mean, there's there's not really much I can say other than I, I created a new material uh, by just mixing a ton of powders inside of crucible, putting them inside of a furnace at like 1050 Celsius and then cooling them down slowly so the crystals formed and then kind of just chipping the crystals out so I can get like these nice little single crystals, putting them on like this one little tiny paintbrush with glue on it and it could be put into this machine where it would be able to pass a laser through it and then read uh, the crystal structure of the material by like uh, X-ray diffraction using XRD. Uh, and uh, that's how we kind of knew that it was a new material. After we looked at the structure and after we looked at the atoms that were in the material, then we realized that we were onto something new because uh, it was not cataloged in any database that we uh, had access to. Did you get to name it? No, no. So like, that's the thing is that um, like you don't really get to name uh, the materials anymore. Mm, uh, so sad. I think like we essentially play God. Let's let's be real for a second. Like, Love like that. You, you playing God doesn't just mean like you're you're creating life. Like it also means that you're just creating something that doesn't exist or technically shouldn't exist. Uh, but my professor told me uh, something very interesting and it sticks with me to this day. He said that he believes that uh, every material that we can create already exists. It just doesn't exist here and we haven't seen it in the conditions on this earth. So it could exist somewhere out in the infinite universe uh, and we just have yet to synthesize it. We have yet to discover it. That's profound. Yeah, it, it really, it really, uh, made the experience uh, a whole lot more interesting and uh, I don't know, very, really dumbfounding. I'm not going to lie, uh, because you made a new material. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you just, made a new material, but anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. I did it. You can do it. Trust me. Like if I can do it, you can do it too. You can probably do it better than me and not by mistake. So this is what you did for ISF, right? Yeah. Like then you submitted this. Did you have to write up a research paper? Yeah, so um, for ISF, you have to write up a research paper, and you have to have an abstract, and you have to have all of this paperwork uh, documenting who you worked under, uh, in what capacity did they help you, uh, what were the safety measures that you took. That's another thing. Make sure you take the right safety precautions. Don't let anything slip through the cracks. Also, be completely honest about how much work you did and uh, and how much work your professor did in relation to your project. Otherwise, it'll make you seem like a fraud. Uh, but I, I just really want to like make something clear is that that's, that's kind of where I disagree with ISF and a lot of these competitions is that uh, they, they kind of look down on a lot of collaborative research or they look down on uh, you know, your professors being too involved. Uh, I don't really agree with that because when you get into the real world, when you start doing like, you know, a ton of research, then uh, you realize it's really bureaucratic. You're not going to be doing, you know, all the research yourself. You're probably going to be doing, you know, a small part of the research. That's part of a bigger project that involves so many people uh, at so many different universities. Yes, I did have some write a research paper uh, and it was... It was nerve wracking, but you know, when you do your own research and when you're really passionate about it, you can keep writing and writing and writing. And then eventually you'll just have to actually cut down your work. That's, that's better. It's always better to overwrite than to underwrite. And do, do they have like page requirements or page limits? I don't think so. Uh, I think they had like maybe a, a minimum word count or like a maximum word count for the abstract, mm -hmm. uh, which gotcha. I think was like 250 words. That's that's a lot, by the way. Like for an abstract, that is a that is a lot of words. Because uh, usually, you know, an abstract should be around fifty words. Yeah. Fifty yeah. to a hundred words. So when I you know filled out my application and stuff, uh, that's kind of like what my mind was set on. You know, I really wanted to you know make moves and be able to talk to all of these people that were really interested in doing research as much as I was. So that's like your motivation. And then your passion for your research should be the driving force behind you being able to write a great research paper. 
and then also preparing for the uh, for the uh, for the face to face component. Yeah, yeah. Uh, being being able to um, get ready for judging and the interviews. Yeah. So actually, can you tell us a little bit about what that entails with the day of the competition or the several days of the competition yeah. were like and how that went, what the different rounds are like, and if there's like you have to present, do you yeah. have to answer questions about science? Do you need to answer questions just about your research or science in general? Okay. Um, so with the regional competitions, it's it's all dependent on the region uh, and the specific, you know, president and whoever is putting together the competition, uh, they decide how you're going to be judged, how many judges you're going to get. Uh, but I'll just tell you, like, from my experience, uh, I went to LICEF and NICEF. Uh, so one was Long Island Science and Engineering Fair, and the other one was the New York State Science and Engineering Fair. Uh, and I made it to ICEF through NICEF, uh, through the state level. So LICEF was a two-day thing although uh, the first day was qualifiers. So you had to, you know, be able to uh, just go through, I think, around three judges, around three-ish judges. Uh, and that's pretty much the same thing for NICEF. You could potentially have four judges, but um, at LICEF, it was very cut and dry. You know, your judges would come up to you and they would, uh, you know, introduce themselves, they would ask you, you know, what your project is about. And either they'll let you, you know, give your whole canned presentation or they just won't. And they will start asking you questions based off of what they've read. Sometimes they'll even just ask if they can take like a minute or two to read your board and then ask you questions based off of that. Uh, and that could also happen at NICEF, although I think that the, uh, that the judges at NICEF, um, were a little more engaged uh, with with the students and you know what they were trying to do and what and they're trying to like dig to see how passionate you were about your project and that's why I say like you know you should always be really passionate about your research you have to be really you know enthusiastic when you give your presentation otherwise you're gonna think you hate your project and you don't want to be there uh, and I think that was probably the the best thing for me, uh, that I was always enthusiastic. I was always pointing out stuff to them. I was giving them little tidbits, uh, that weren't on the board because, you know, you want to, you want to leave a little bit of mystery so that they have something to ask. And then you have like an actual response. You don't want them to catch you off guard, uh, because then that's when you start stuttering. And then that's when you can't come up with a good response and then you're screwed. Is like, that a big part of the criteria, just enthusiasm and passion? What else are they looking for? There are actually like a ton of rubrics that you could find online mm -hmm. uh, from your specific regional competition. And I recommend that you follow those to a T so they can cross off their boxes and then give you like, and then if they see like you're waning in some areas, maybe they can give you something like a little extra, like they can make up for those points by seeing how enthusiastic you are and how engaged you were with your project. They do check your paperwork, they want it displayed on your table, uh, and they demand a copy of your abstract. Demand? You make them sound like the mafia. I don't know which one is scarier, uh, but I don't know, they kind of hold your life in their hands. Where is the lie? Uh, and it's... It's a scary experience at first, but then you kind of get into the groove of it. And then once you realize, you know, if you're if your judge is really enthusiastic, you know, and you have like a charming back and forth between the two of you, then you know like you're in the clear with that judge. Uh, and they could be impressed with the work that you that you've been doing. Uh, some of them could be really really hard on you and uh, ask like oh, how did you do all this research like on your own? I'm like, well, I didn't exactly do all this research on my own. I had a little bit of help and guidance from my mentors. And that's where it gets tricky. Don't let them, you know, like uh, force you into saying that, you know, you didn't do any of this work because you did do this work, all right? You just have to, you know, like own it. 
Be proud of yourself. Exactly. Be proud. Don't be cocky. And be completely honest. How did you learn about SFYs? All right. So uh, when I was in high school, in the ninth grade, I was introduced to the science research program. That's the main reason why I attended the high school that I did. And I started learning about very large science competitions, although I didn't know how big they could get. And then someone told me about ISEF. And when I heard about that, I was determined to be able to go because that sounded like such a great opportunity, you know, a great networking opportunity. That's all I was after uh, when I was in that program, was just networking with other students, being able to make those connections and start working with other people. Uh, we wanted to be able to understand science as scientists, not just students that were doing like these rag tech projects and then going on about it and saying, oh, well, we're scientists because we know how to make a paper mache volcano. I mean, it's a, it's a great start, but uh, if you really want to become invested in science, then it takes more than just, you know, one person, it takes more than just one mind, it takes more than just the internet to introduce you to science. Uh, so, as I went along the science research program, I did have like some pretty uh, mediocre projects my first two years. Uh, first year was something in paleontology, which was what I was interested in at first. Uh, and it was literally just relative dating of shark teeth. Wasn't exciting at all. I was bored uh, like halfway through the project. And That's exciting to me. You see, it does until you have to catalog like a hundred shark teeth uh, <laughs> with no help. Uh, I mean, I was able to get some help and that's actually a very important thing. Uh, so when I sought out help for that project, I contacted museum curators and uh, a ton of uh, paleontology and fossil clubs that were in nearby states so that they could pass on uh, their experience and their knowledge to you so that you can also be successful in the field or at least somewhat successful uh, because after all, I was only in high school and I was a freshman at that time. Uh, then the following year, I did a short summer program at Sony Brook called GeoPrep uh, and that was earth and environmental sciences mixed in with like astronomy and stuff. And you were able to kind of uh, develop your own project based off of the environments that we were looking at and the certain things we had. And I kind of took hold of the wheel myself. So I uh, shifted lanes into uh, astronomy and astrophysics. And I was really determined to do some research into micrometeorites. Um, I don't know. That was also a bust. You see, uh, the the best part about science and about you know trying to figure out what you want what you want to do is that there's a lot of error and failure, and also a lot of getting bored. So when you get bored, then you realize you don't want to do that stuff anymore. Uh, <laughs> and, I mean, that's pretty obvious. Like if you just if you if you're really bored, then just don't do it uh, and move on to something else. And then in the summer uh, of my sophomore year, I did find something that I did not get bored with that I was very interested in. Uh, and that's a, that's a whole other thing. That's like the main- Main attraction. The, yeah, that's, that's, yes. where, that's where the real story begins. Because everything else was uh, eh, bullshit. So backstory, you're like, <laughs> tragic backstory of being a wannabe scientist yeah it wasn't it wasn't great uh because it, it's true it was like a wannabe scientist story and i hate to say it but like i was a complete amateur i was so naive i was way in over my head uh when it came to trying to do you know whatever i was doing uh and for the first two years in the science research program, no one really took me that seriously, you know? Um, it was usually people that ended up doing uh, biology projects with bacteria and stuff and mold and whatever it was. I mean, nothing against life sciences, but that was just not my cup of tea. Uh, and 
my school was really big on environmental science. So when I didn't really fit the mold, or I didn't like try and mesh with them. Then uh, there was a tiny bit of like rejection when it came to, um, you know, asking for help or trying to become a priority student when it came to competitions. So I, I noticed that one of my friends was able to start working with a professor at a local college. And so um, I started looking for professors in the field that I wanted to work in uh, at that same college. So uh, I did get one response. I got one single response. Uh, and that was from uh, one mentor. He's a man that changed my life. Uh, definitely made me into the scientist that I am today. Uh, made me into the person that I am today. And I, I can't thank him enough. I went into the lab after he asked me to come in for an interview. So he asked me to come in for an interview and it wasn't an interview. He, he invited me into his office and he said, like, don't worry, this isn't an interview. You have the job. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, he's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, because you seem really interested and passionate about your work and we'll get you started with whatever we uh, do here right away. Uh, so he told me that we grow crystals and then he kind of uh, elaborated onto that handed me some literature and next thing I know I'm doing research in condensed matter physics which is uh, the study of solids and liquids on the quantum level. Very cool. So why physics? I know you're saying that you weren't a huge fan of life sciences but what was it about the physical sciences that really got to you and made you want to do research in that? So as I understood it physics is pretty much the foundation of all the other sciences um, you know, there's not a hierarchy, but it's kind of just a, a chain, uh, of development. And so at the very core, all science is based off of mathematics, but I didn't feel like I was equipped to do mathematics research. I mean, that would take just a whole different, you know, skill set. Uh, and I wanted to do something that was still in the sciences. So if you really think about it, physics is just applied mathematics, uh, and that appealed to me. Uh, and then chemistry would be applied physics somewhat. And then biology would come off of that with, like, you know, applied chemistry and then so on and so forth until you get like to other, you know, more narrowed down fields but I wanted to kind of like be at the base of the pyramid. So I decided on physics. So you were saying before that you emailed a whole bunch of these different professors and only one got back, like he was awesome. And you guys did have that really strong mentor mentee relationship and he's still really influential for you even today, right? So I was wondering if you had any advice for everyone who might be interested in figuring out how they too can get in touch with a professor or a college or a lab, like what are the first steps and how do you go about making those connections and expanding your network and getting a place to do the research at and people to help guide you. Yeah, so there are a ton of ways to go about um, becoming involved in independent research, uh, becoming part of a research group. Uh, so one way is through the actual programs, the uh, research experiences that are provided by universities and local colleges for high school students uh, and that could open a whole bunch of doorways at once. It adds a, a layer of credibility, I'd have to say, because you were good enough to get into the research program itself. Uh, so obviously the professors on campus that you'll be interacting with will already know that you are somewhat experienced in research or you are gaining the experience in their field or whatever research you wanna do. and they recognize they recognize that you are um, a, a viable candidate for you know their research group and at some point i'm planning to put out a video about all the best top you know summer stem programs out there so you guys can get a sense also sorry about that don't you just love the city yeah. favorite uh, place in the world 
So um, another way to go about it is by taking it into your own hands and emailing professors yourselves. Now, I did that, but it was also like a combination between that and the thing that I just mentioned before, which was, uh, you know, going through a summer program. So I did go through a summer program at a local university uh, and I did have some research experience before that. And I kind of used that in my email that I drafted to, uh, to a bunch of professors and, you know, all of them were individualized. Don't trust me. Do not, do not make that type of mistake where you write a generic email and then you send it to every single person in that department because they talk they talk to each other they're friends all right they work together and if they realize that you know you just sent them all the same exact email then they will probably reject you oh my god spitting real truth here i did email a bunch of professors in the same department but i did not give them the same email all right uh and if i would have done that then I don't think I would be good friends or colleagues with those professors now. Okay, so I think that definitely covers a lot of what ISIF is like, what kind of research you did, but are you literally eating Oreos right now? I, can, I, I can't. I haven't eaten today. I'm sorry. That's a huge problem. But yeah, so what are your other interests and hobbies and how did you balance doing science research and competitions and everything with those other areas? And please, take your time. Swallow first. We'll wait. What was the question again? <laughs> how did you balance your other hobbies and interests with your science research? All right, so... Um... I'd always been invested in, you know, in, in science. Um, so like from a really young age, I was part of a program where I was able to go and take like some, uh, not like college level courses, but just be able to uh, get involved in scientific research and stuff. And then once I uh, like was not part of that program anymore, cause I was like really, really young, like around four or five. Um, Maybe JC. And then, um, I kind of just spent my time online, you know, just looking up stuff that I thought was cool in science. So, um, I always dedicated time to that. And I also always dedicated time to, you know, like playing music, uh, which is another one of my hobbies. He's really good at guitar. No, yes. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, but, uh, sounds good to me. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, but I had always had time, you know, like sectioned off to do, you know, like music and look into science and stuff. So as time went on, I still had that time set aside. So like, uh, it kind of just changed from, you know, like me being part of like those programs when I was really young to me just like looking up stuff online to me being able to do research in that same time frame. Uh, I dedicated it pretty much half my time to that. Uh, so there was really no change in like the, uh, the work-life balance, I guess. Uh, but for anyone who's having trouble with uh, balancing it out, um, if science becomes your passion, then you'll definitely find time for it. Uh, That's how you know something is your passion, guys, exactly. and you're not like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. It's so easy to say, oh, this is my passion, but you know, if it's if it's something that you really enjoy doing, then you'll be willing to work through the hard times. And there will definitely be hard times, but you'll just have that enjoyment. And even if you're not enjoying it right then and there, it'll be like that need to go on that will bolster you through the trickier times where like everything is going wrong because you know there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be a chore. It should be, you know, something you enjoy doing. It should basically become your hobby. And yeah. then it'll evolve into like, you know, your career. It wasn't that hard for me to find the balance because I had always been interested in science. So all that time looking into it had just translated into the time that I would use to do research. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, JC. I think that should be a lot of information for you guys to parse through. And hopefully this has taught you a lot about ISEF, but also science research in general, giving you guys a different perspective than usual from this channel. And what I'm hoping is to interview a lot more of my friends who are interested in really cool things like this. Who will definitely knows? do a better interview than me. Maybe we'll see you again on this channel. Oh, that would geez. be awesome. And you did wonderfully. Thank you so much, JC. I really appreciate it. Thank this you was, for having me. Yeah, this is awesome. I was going to shake you like one hand with both the hands. That, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. But thank you so much. And yeah, wait, maybe we will see him again on the channel sometime soon. You guys can definitely ask us any questions in the comments down below. And definitely don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more videos, both like this and of course, what you're more used to with the humanities, different competitions and different like summer programs that you might be able to go to. Some of those things that will help you both with pursuing your passions and then later on getting into college all that really good stuff. So be sure to stay tuned for lots more like this. Be sure to like this video if you enjoyed it. Hit that notification bell so you're notified every time I post and share this video with your friends who are also interested in science research because friends help friends, you guys. We gotta work together. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye for now. Do you wanna do the sign off with me? Come on. What's the sign off? And I was able to, uh... Hey, Kwong. Hi, Kwong. How's it going? Is this, is this an Instagram thing? No. <laughs> it's my YouTube channel. Wow. How's do you want to come say hi? You have a YouTube channel? I yeah. do. Wow. Yes, you should come say hi. Nice microphone. Thank you. <laughs> what are you guys recording? So I'm interviewing JC about science competitions and things. Cool. Thanks. Nice. Fun time. <laughs> nice haircut. Wait, but he's No. 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 Dude, you saw me last night. I, I realized this, but your hair is shorter, no? It's moisture. Well, that's because it was up yesterday. Like, it was, it was, like, up. Okay, wait. Okay, so this is my hair down, right? Yes. But, like, when my hair is, like, dry, like, and up. Then it looks longer. This is indeed science. Exactly. Even We're more. including all of this. Oh Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Wonderful. Good luck. Thank you, Kwong. Um, Have a great day. Where are you headed? To go to bed. Oh, okay. Yes. Have fun. Oh, yes, you guys. Sounds too. good. Are you staying over the break here? No, I just came in because I have stuff to do in the city and I was like, we need to film this video. So wow. I came here and then I'm going to see some family friends. Where are you from? New Jersey. Ah. So it was a super long plane ride, of you know, Very jet lagged. Bye. I'll see you later. Yeah. Later, boy. That was fun. I that was fun. fun. I love fun. Uh,